Welcome back, y'all, to the second part of our extended conversations focusing on step six of the LANA algorithm. Notice we are working on the example two in the LANA algorithm, which has 12 circuit elements, two voltage sources, two current sources, and eight resistors. Right now, we just finished step six, which was determine all ordinary and generalized nodes. We're spending extra time in these videos to go behind and talk about the foundation so that when we get towards the end of this algorithm, we can refer back to this knowledge to understand the theoretical framework upon which all these steps are built. It's worth noting that the entire focus of steps six through 11 of our algorithm are designed to reduce the number of unknown variables and reduce the number of equations required to completely analyze our circuit. Let me be more specific about that. Remember that in step four, we stated these three separate vectors, the voltage drop vector, the current vector, and the node voltage potential vector, which combined had a total of 31 variables in this case. And then for each of those vectors, we, in step five, used them to state circuit equations based on three types of equations, which were node potential KVLs, branch constitutive relationships, in this case, Ohm's law, and then finally, Kirchhoff's current laws. Those were a lot of equations in a lot of unknowns. In step six, we've now identified generalized and ordinary nodes. And the claim is from this point forward, we're going to reduce the number of unknowns that show up from step four and the number of equations needed to analyze the circuit from step five. With the goal of getting rid of extra variables in our system, I wanna say that there are two different types of reductions that we're gonna do. The first type of reduction has to do with eliminating dependencies between the entries of our node voltage potential vector U sub G that arise due to the voltage sources in our circuit. And that shows up in step six, nine, 10, and 11. Step six sets the foundation for this type of elimination. Without step six, the rest of these things get really, really hard. The other type of elimination that we're gonna do is called eliminating the ground node of the circuit. And we'll talk more about that in step seven and then eliminate the corresponding equations in step eight of this algorithm. Here, we're extending our conversation of step six so we can really get a firm theoretic foundation on what's going on when we get rid of those variables. So as a recap, the whole point of step six is to set us up to eliminate dependencies amongst the entries of U sub G that arise based on the voltage sources. Remember though, that we interpreted the dependencies in the entries of U sub G in a few different ways. One of those ways was to think about each voltage source as yielding a single scalar equation, a single KVL, which said that the voltage drop across each source was equal to the difference of the node potentials at the source. But for each generalized node in our circuit, we could choose one independent voltage potential and all other nodes connected to that generalized node would be dependent. In this case, because we have a single generalized node with only one voltage source, we have only two choices to go from. One of them, we could say that the green U2 is dependent on orange U7. We'll call that choice V1.1, like in previous videos. Or the other one is a swap them, call the orange U7 dependent and the green U2 independent. Similarly for voltage source two, we only have two choices because our generalized node two only has one voltage source. We could say that U4 is independent and U5 depends on that or vice versa. The benefit of the linear algebraic approach is that we can interpret those scalar equations using matrix vector data structures. So in particular, we said that the voltage source voltage drop KVLs could be written as a general linear systems problem involving the incidence matrix associated with the voltage sources and the right-hand side vector, which were defined by the values of the voltage sources. And then we wanted to know what the node potentials would look like. But we said in the last video, in the first part of our extension to step six, that this general information could be partitioned into two different types of information. One was called a particular solution, having to do with the particular values of the voltage sources. And the other one was any trivial solution to the homogeneous linear system. This is where that linear algebraic knowledge comes in so handy. Particular solutions solve the original problem. So if I multiplied the incidence matrix times the particular solution, I would get back to the right-hand side vector. It's a specific example of a solution. And we also knew that by a theorem in linear algebra, 
any trivial solution is going to be a linear combination of the linearly independent special trivial solutions associated with each non-pivot column of our original matrix. So when we actually look at the node potential vector and we want to eliminate dependencies, we could break it into those pieces of information, the particular solution plus a linear combination of linearly independent special trivial solutions. This linear combination we could write as a matrix vector product where the number of columns in that matrix is equal to the number of non-pivot columns of our entire voltage source incidence matrix. But for our specific example, this matrix shows like that, this vector shows like that. And we wanted to find a way to decompose the complete homogeneous solution into linear combinations of linearly independent special trivial solutions. In order to do that, our enumeration of the individual vectors z1, z2, all the way to z5 are going to depend on the specific choices of independent and dependent node potential variables that we make in our circuit. In our case, let's go ahead and make the first of each possible choice. So in choice V sub V1, we're going to say, let's assume that for generalized node, 1, U7 is going to be our independent, and all other nodes that show up are going to be dependent on U7. Well, there's only one other node that showed up because there's only one voltage source connected to generalized node 1. So we say that U2 would be equal to U7 plus V sub V1. Similarly, in generalized node 2, let's assume that U4 was independent. All other node variables that show up in that generalized nodes are going to be dependent on node 4. In this case, there's only one. Now we have those two equations. Remember, we're trying to figure out how to decompose any trivial solution. And we've just said that we have a total of f equal to 5 independent node variables. And we've also chosen what those node variables will be. The first three correspond to ordinary nodes. There's no cross-pollination between the voltage sources. So U1, U3, and U6 are definitely independent. No voltage sources are connected. Those were called ordinary. In our generalized node, for each generalized node in the circuit, we chose a single independent one. In this case, we said that U7 was independent and U4 was independent, U7 and U4. And check that out. We have one, two, three, four, five independent node voltage potentials in the entire circuit. Moreover, we've eliminated m sub v equals 2 variables from our vector u sub g. In this case, we eliminated the entry u2 and the entry u5. In the more general case, for each voltage source that's connected, we'll be able to eliminate one variable. But the point of this discussion was to figure out how to enumerate the vector z1, z2, all the way to zf, or another way to say that is how to choose the columns of the capital Z matrix. And we just saw that we've chosen variables u1, u3, u4, u6, and u7 to be independent. Let's go ahead and list those in ascending index order, meaning 1 is less than 3, is less than 4, is less than 6, is less than 7. Write them in that order. The moment I do that, we're going to say that z1 corresponds with this independent variable, z2 the second, z3 the third, z4 the fourth, and z5 the sixth, which means those vectors that we generated from the last part of our previous video, we can actually now just put into the appropriate columns of our matrix Z. So the ordinary node U1, we're going to call that vector, which corresponded to how to send A sub VG to zero from ordinary node U1, we're going to call that Z1, column one of the capital Z matrix. Ordinary node two, which corresponded to the independent node voltage potential U3, that was this vector. We're going to drop that into column two of our Z matrix. Node four, that's greater than three and less than six, that's there. That one corresponded to our generalized node two. And in fact, here's that vector. So we're going to drop that vector into the third column. Ordinary node three was U6. That's this one. We'll drop it into the fourth column. And then the last special trivial solution that we had actually correlated with the generalized node one. Because we identified U7 to be independent, here U2 and U7 shows up, U2 disappears. But using that technique, we've just actually formed the capital Z matrix, which has N sub G rows and F 
columns, the number of non-pivot columns of our voltage source into this matrix. Moreover, this matrix was constructed in such a way that if I multiply A sub VG on the right-hand side by Z, I get a zero matrix out because each of the columns of this are in the null space of that matrix. Another way to say that is they solve the homogeneous linear system problem. In fact, you could try that. Go ahead and use a computer algebra system, store this matrix, store that matrix, multiply A sub VG on the right by Z, guess what you're gonna get? Zeros, you're gonna get a uh, zero matrix that is a two by five zero matrix. It annihilates that matrix. But this is where things get really fun and I know what you're gonna say, Jeff, they've been fun the whole time. I know, I know, I agree. Here we go though. The whole point of this thing was to decompose it into the two types of information that I want, particular information that has to do with my right-hand side choice of voltage source values, and then zero information that encodes the unique ways of sending A sub VG to zero. When we made the choices that U2 depended on U7 and U5 depended on U4, it ends up that we could say that U2 was U7 plus V sub V1, U5 was U4 minus V sub V2. And the moment that I say that, I can actually decompose it in the exact form that I want. A particular solution that with reference to the original voltage source values plus a linear combination of special trivial solutions to that system that come from deactivating the voltage sources. Here is the exact matrix Z that we've just constructed using the ordering possibilities. Here, this thing actually shows up in ascending order so that I don't have to permute the actual individual columns. Now, some of you might say, hey, Jeff, I thought you said that these scalars were any scalars. They were free variables. Yeah, that's true. They are still free variables. I'm not determining in this video what the value of U1 should be. I'm not determining what the value of U3, U4, U6, or U7. Those are free. In later variables, as we mix this together with circuit equations, we're gonna see that there are some constraints in the overall circuit that actually uniquely determine what a subset of those variables would be. But for now, all I'm saying is I can reduce my larger set of variables to a set of five variables using the information encoded in the vo voltage sources through the paradigm of particular solution plus something that gets sent to zero. This mechanism of decomposing my node voltage potential vector into dependent information plus independent information is what I would call an algebraic approach or an algebraic perspective. One of the reasons that I find this math to be so beautiful is that we can also filter our work through a graphical approach. Remember, all of this focus on setting the V sub Vs to zero really came from the deactivated circuit heuristic, which had an actual visual representation in what we do to the voltage source in our original circuit. Algebraically, we said when we set that V sub V equal to zero, that means take each of the voltage source values and set those equal to zero, which meant the two node potential variables attached to those sources become the same node potential. From the standpoint of our circuit schematic, when we replaced these voltage sources by these short circuits, that meant that node two became node seven. They're actually identical because they are touching with wire. Node four became node five. Moreover, not only did node two become node seven and node four become node five, we're actually saying, hey, node seven is the one that's left over. We're gonna eliminate node two from our circuit completely. Node four is the one that's gonna stay. We're gonna eliminate node five from our circuit completely. Another way to think about that is to think about everything connected to node seven as node seven. So everything that used to be in green becomes in orange. Everything that used to be in red becomes in yellow. But this has a visual realization in the digraph model to our original circuit. When I meld node two and seven together, that's as if I'm taking this node two of my digraph model and then literally like bringing it over to node seven. If I did that, look at this, node two is the initial node of edge two, but I'm claiming that node two becomes node seven. In other words, I'm literally gonna bring this thing down over here, which means edge two is gonna actually condense into this thing. That kind of makes sense because the whole point of that translation was that edge nine actually disappears. We're setting that edge to zero. We're literally forcing those two things together. There's some cool topology here for you math heads that really get excited about this stuff. But what that means is I could actually redraw edge two as coming out of node seven into node one. Edge one stays the same. I haven't touched edge one because node one was an ordinary node. 
I'm not messing around with those. Same thing here, edge three comes out of node two into node seven. When I force node two into node seven by eliminating edge nine, edge three actually goes out of node seven back into node seven. In graph theory, that's called a self loop. I'm gonna go ahead and draw that in light pencil because there's some special engineering considerations about self loops. Specifically, in circuits, we don't allow self loops. The last effect that merging node two to node seven has is that E4 is supposed to start at node two, but when I merge it, it now starts at node seven, which means edge four comes out of node seven into node three. That's what happens when I reduce that. Similarly, when I do my deactivation heuristic, I set my current sources to zero, which means the corresponding edges disappeared. So edge 11 and edge 12 disappear from this model because of the fact that I've deactivated the current sources. When I look at node five, I am collapsing that node along edge 10 into node four. In other words, node five becomes node four. There's no more node five in this representation. Edge eight was supposed to start at node five and go into node six, but node five became node four. So that means edge eight actually starts at node four and goes down to node six. E5 and E7 are left alone because they both start from independent ordinary nodes three and six, and they go into independent nodes four and seven. Four was independent because we chose it to be independent. This implied that the act of algebraically finding how to send these circuits to zero was equivalent to, in the generalized case, condensing a bunch of nodes into a single independent node, all the other ones dependent, they disappear along the edges for the voltage sources. The one bit of maintenance that we do is anytime a self loop shows up in the corresponding new reduced directed graph model, we delete it. In circuit theory, there's no such thing as a self loop. Another way to say that is because the node voltage potentials U2 and U7 are assumed to be the same, there's no voltage drop across resistor three. That's equivalent to taking one end of the resistor touching the metal to the other end of the resistor, there's no electronic behavior going on there, which means the corresponding deactivated resistor circuit has a digraph model that does not include edge three because we've deleted the self loops. But this circuit, this deactivated resistor circuit is a circuit in its own right, and thus it does have a digraph model. We'll call that the deactivated resistor circuit digraph model. That was the one that we just analyzed by collapsing all but one node for each generalized node in the circuit. This digraph model has a corresponding incidence matrix. In fact, we have eight original resistors. We can write those along the edges like we do for all incidence matrix. The nodes of the circuit, we're gonna use the original labels that we started with is one, three, four, six, and seven. Those were the independent node labels that we decided on with reference to step six. Then what we're gonna say is let's go ahead and encode each edge so we know that edge one goes from out of node one into node seven, there's edge one. Edge two goes out of node seven into node two. Edge three is effectively gone from our system, so there's no node information in edge three. And I'll let you all confirm for yourself that the rest of the edges, the rest of the information encoded in that digraph model of the deactivated resistor circuit looks like this. Another way to say that is we just formed an incidence matrix for the deactivated resistor circuit corresponding with the digraph model for that circuit. There it is without the row and column labels. But remember that this matrix, the matrix that set my original voltage source subblock of the entire incidence matrix for the original graph to zero had some special realization and this is where things get just so beautiful. That matrix Z, if I were to multiply the matrix Z by the resistor subblock of the entire incidence matrix that I got in step three of this algorithm, here's a claim. Taking the incidence matrix of the original circuit schematic, focusing in on only the resistive subpart of that, the edges of that digraph corresponding to the resistors. That's what this information encodes right there. It is a eight by seven matrix because there are eight resistors and seven nodes. When I multiply that resistive part by the thing that sends the voltage source information by to zero, that capital Z matrix, I actually get the incidence matrix corresponding to the deactivated resistive circuit digraph model. Moreover, the columns of this reduced matrix correspond to the chosen independent nodes that I've gotten either from ordinary nodes, one, three, and six, or the chosen independent nodes corresponding to each generalized node. In this case, we chose four and seven arbitrarily. We could have done other choices. 
I'm hoping at the end of this whole playlist, I'll actually show you that it doesn't matter which independent choices we make. In fact, we could have done it the other way. This is extremely powerful. The incidence matrix corresponding to the deactivated resistor circuit digraph model is the original incidence matrix corresponding to the resistors times a matrix that has full column rank and sends the voltage source information to zero. But this algebraic equation corresponds to something called a connected graph. In graph theory, we say that a connected graph is a graph in which we can get from any node to any other node via a path of edges. Now in digraph theory, there's something called weak connections and strong connections. Weak connections and strong connections have to do with uh, orientation of the edges, but we don't care about weak connectedness and strong connectedness. All we care about is, are there edges between all the nodes? Can I get from any node to any other node? In fact, as long as my original circuit didn't have two sub circuits that were connected together by current sources, these deactivated resistor circuits will always be connected when I deactivate my circuit. This is super powerful because it says that the number of linearly independent columns of this digraph is gonna be one less than the total number of columns. In other words, this matrix will always have F columns. The rank of the metrics is gonna be F minus one, but we remember that F was gonna be the number of original nodes minus the number of voltage sources. When we subtract one on this, this is the number of linearly independent node potential variables that I need to analyze my entire circuit. We could not hope for a better result. There is a famous theorem in graph theory that says that if we have an incidence matrix for a connected graph, which is exactly what we have here, an incidence matrix corresponding to the connected graph, which is the deactivated resistor circuit encoded, the rank of that matrix is one less than the number of columns in that matrix, which is in this case, the number of nodes in our graph. What we've done in step six is to say the number of columns of that matrix, the number of independent nodes with respect to the voltage sources is the number of nodes minus the number of voltage sources. Subtract one by that, we get the rank of the deactivated circuit. The reason that this is super important is we're, the whole point of the LANA algorithm is to transform this circuit analysis problem into a very, very famous structure, A transpose C A. The matrix C is gonna be a diagonal matrix with the conductance values of each resistor on the diagonal. We saw that as step 5B. And then this thing is gonna be a grounded incidence matrix with respect to the deactivated circuit. We say that this matrix is positive definite when the columns of the matrix A are linearly independent. This tells us when the columns are linearly independent. This implies that the simple act of determining generalized nodes and ordinary nodes set up this plethora of linear algebraic and graphic structure that allows us to dip into each of those fields in a very creative and powerful way. This description is really designed for extremely motivated students and practicing engineers and mathematicians to justify some of the propositions that I'm going to make later in the algorithm without formal proof. I have outlined the entire theoretic structures one would need to prove all of this formally. In the next video, we're gonna come back to earth and continue with step seven of our algorithm, which is to ground the circuit and eliminate one more variable that we'll need from the entire set of variables. I'll see you there.